All right, folks, here, section 12.3, we're going to look at the calculus and polar coordinates. Still have the same two big questions that we always have uh, from going back to Calc 1, what you should have heard in Calc 1, the beginnings of calculus. You know, the two big questions that we analyze um, and the two big questions we analyze when talking about calculus and polar coordinates. Big question number one, the slope of a tangent line instantaneous rate of change and big question number two is area again these two big questions should not be a surprise so we're going to begin by attacking big question number one tangent lines all right folks now here's the first thing i have to say uh, we know in polar world uh, r is equal to a function of theta we see stuff like r equals one plus cosine theta so the first thing is dr d theta does not give the slope of a polar graph. dr d theta does not give the slope of a tangent line. It does not do that for us. What I'd like you to think is what dr d theta really does tell us, and I'm going, I'm going back to the language of rates of change. dr th d theta tells us the rate of change of r, which remember r is the directed distance from the pole, with respect to theta. Remember theta is the directed angle. So if anything, dr d theta, which tells us the rate of change of r with respect to theta, it could be used to tell us relative extrema. And remember in the polar world, uh, relative extrema would be the point on the curve that is farthest away from the pole. That would be a relative maximum. And any points that would be closest to the pole, that would be the relative minimum. So that's what dr d theta would actually tell us. Uh, doesn't tell us slope of tangent lines, but it could be used to tell us relative extrema. A quick note is that if you graph a polar equation and you see the graph passes through the pole, well, you can't get closer to the pole than passing through the pole. So that would mean uh, if you're going through the pole for whatever the polar equation is, that means r equals zero. I don't need dr d theta. I can just set my polar equation equal to zero and determine when r is zero, when the distance from the pole is zero, you pass through the pole. So how in the world are we going to find tangent lines if dr d theta does not tell us the slope of a tangent line? Well, there's a reason why in the last section, and I started off pretty early in, in this uh, video, talking about r is a function of theta. In the last section, we did review conversions from uh, polar world to rectangular world and vice versa. So we reviewed x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. If we sub, since r is equal to f of theta, if we substitute f of theta in for the r's, we get x equals f of theta cosine theta and y equals f of theta sine theta. This is looking an awful lot like, that's right, parametric equations. Folks, we can use our knowledge of how to differentiate parametric equations to determine that the slope in the polar world, slope is given by dy dx. And dy dx is dy d theta over dx d theta. So if you look at y equals f of theta sine theta, uh, to get dy d theta, you just use the product rule. So that gives you f prime theta sine theta plus f theta cosine theta. Look at x. x is f of theta cosine theta. So dx d theta is just use the product rule. f prime theta cosine theta minus f of theta sine theta. So I'm going to I'm going to go back and use knowledge I already have how to differentiate parametric equations. What I've just outlined here is kind of um, um, 
you know, quote, prove the following theorem. Uh, I prefer to say, you know, we just kind of discovered it. We just did it. Um, so even though what we just did will go into a theorem, I am going to stress that I do not need to memorize the formula that we're going to see in the following theorem. As long as I remember the conversion formulas on how to go from polar to rectangular, those conversion formulas at the top of the slide, and we remember R is F of theta, and just simply differentiation of parametrics tells me there is nothing new here. But I'd be remiss without writing down the following theorem. If f is a differentiable function of theta, then the slope of the tangent line to r equals f of theta at r theta is given by, well, what we just discovered on the previous slide. And then I have to add this on, provided that uh, the denominator does not equal zero, which we all know that by now. I do have a few notes, though, uh, in general. The first one, if dy d theta equals zero, so the numerator is zero, that tells us we have a horizontal tangent, provided, of course, dx d theta does not equal zero. You know, note two, dx d theta equals zero, that tells us there's a vertical tangent provided, of course, that dy d theta does not equal zero. So what if we have some, some theta where dy d theta and dx d theta are both equal to zero? Well, when that happens, it tells us absolutely nothing. We don't know if there's a horizontal tangent or a vertical tangent. We, uh, we just need to rectify it. We'd have to rectify it if we wanted to by looking at uh, the graph. So, Let's do a quick example. Consider the polar equation r equals 2 minus 2 cosine theta. Let's find any horizontal and vertical tangents. So you know by now I'm heading off to the chalkboard to do this one. All right, folks, this one, uh, this example we were given r equals 2 minus 2 cosine theta. We're asked to find horizontal and vertical tangents. I just made a note that with the horizontal tangent, that's where dy d theta will be zero, but dx d theta is not zero. Vertical tangents when dx d theta is zero, but dy d theta is not zero. So, you know, we have this theorem, but I'm not going to use the theorem. I mean, how did we come up with the theorem? We use stuff that we already know. We know y equals r sine theta. We're told what r is, so I put, I substitute this in for r. So I have y equaling this. I can determine dy d theta is, I, mean, I can get the derivative, it's just going to be the product rule. So let me bracket stuff off here. So let's see, uh, the derivative of the first function is 2 sine theta times the second plus the first. And then the derivative of sine is cosine. Keep in mind, we want to know where this is equal to 0. So I'll set it equal to 0. Uh, simplify a little bit. This is a 2 sine squared theta. Um, and then that would give us a plus 2 cosine theta minus 2 cosine squared theta. Trig equation that we're trying to solve, and we have two trig functions in here. We have a sine and we have a cosine. I would like to see nothing but cosines. I can easily do that by using a Pythagorean identity and replace sine squared with 1 minus cosine squared. And then, uh, you know what, each one of these terms has a factor of 2. Why don't I divide both sides of this equation by 2 and combine like terms at the same time? 
So I would have, see, a negative cosine squared. Uh, so what does that give me? A negative cosine squared. I divide by 2, that would be a negative cosine squared. So that's a negative 2 cosine squared theta. Divide by 2, so that leaves me with a cosine theta. Divide by 2, so, oh, that just leaves me with a plus 1. Then I would multiply both sides. I would multiply both sides by negative 1 because I hope this factors. And I do not attempt to factor something in public that has a negative leading coefficient. And, oh boy, let's see. Does it factor? I have a 2 cosine theta here, cosine theta here. I think a minus 1, plus 1. Uh, yep, that's the factorization. So we set each factor equal to 0. So we have 0 is 2 cosine theta plus 1. 0 is cosine theta minus 1. And, you know, here if you add 1 to both sides, you're going to get 1 equals cosine theta. So that gives you, uh, that occurs at theta equals 0. Here you subtract 1 from both sides and divide both sides by 2. I mean, that gives you cosine theta is negative 1 half. Well, cosine theta is negative 1 half at theta equals 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. Now, keep in mind, I only care what's happening here. I don't think I mentioned this on the interval 0 to 2 pi. All right. I can't claim right now that these three values for theta are producing horizontal tangents. I can't make that claim. I have to go do the vertical case because if any one of these three appear in the vertical case, well, that would be a value of theta where both dy d theta and dx d theta are zero, and we don't know what's going on there. So let's go look at the vertical case. So the vertical case, where does dx d theta equal zero? Well, we know x is r cosine theta, and since r is 2 minus 2 cosine theta, x is this mess. <coughs> so now for this one, before I go ahead and do the derivative, before I get dx d theta, I'm going to put in one more extra step, one little step. I'm going to, I'm going to distribute the cosine. I could have done that here when I was getting dy d theta. Uh, we'd get the same answer. I just wanted to, you know, do one one way, do the other one the other way. So here we go, dx d theta. All right, so the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Uh, remember, this is cosine theta quantity squared, so we'd have a 4 cosine theta. And then the chain rule derivative of cosine is negative sine theta. We want to know where this is equal to 0. Oh, I think that would be a plus now. Negative times negative. Uh, 4 cosine theta sine theta. Yeah, you know what? We can factor on the right side. Notice how both of these terms have a factor of sine theta. I mean, heck, both of these terms also have a factor of uh, negative 2. So I'll factor out a negative 2 sine theta to leave me with a 1 minus 2 cosine theta. Set each factor equal to 0. Here, divide both sides by negative 2. 
Here, uh, subtract 1, divide by negative 2. And so you get, uh, where does sine theta equals 0? Well, sine theta equals 0 at 0 and pi. Cosine theta equals 1 half at pi over 3. and 5 pi over 3. So, now we got to try to answer the question. Where do we have vertical tangents? Where do we have horizontal tangents? So look in the list of candidates for horizontal tangents. Look at the list of candidates for vertical tangents. Anything that you see is in both lists, we just have to put off to the side and say, we don't know what's happening there. We would have to look at the graph of this to try to see what is happening. So do you see anything in both lists? I do. I see zero in both lists. So we don't know what's happening at a theta value of zero. So I'm going to uh, do a little bit of erasing here. Keep in mind, I don't know what's happening for zero. I'm coming back to the horizontal case now. We don't know what's happening at a theta value of zero because it's in that list for, for vertical as well. So we have two candidates. Uh, we have two values of theta where there's a horizontal tangent. Two pi over three and four pi over three. So let me, uh, let me erase this. We have horizontal tangents. At theta is 2 pi over 3, and, and theta was 4 pi over 3. But to, to really answer the question, where are their horizontal tangents? We just know the thetas. We would have to determine the r's. Because we're talking about a point on the polar graph. A point on the graph of this. So you would have to... pi over 3 in here for theta to determine what r is. You'd have to put 4 pi over 3 in here for theta and determine what r is. And I'm going to leave that up to you. The vertical tangents, now remember vertical, we can't count the 0 because 0 is in the horizontal case as well. So there are three thetas that will produce a vertical tangent. So I'm going to erase this and list those three thetas that will do that, the three values of theta. And we have vertical tangents at those three values of theta were pi over 3, pi and 5 pi over 3. So what you would have to do is you have to put pi over 3, pi, and 5 pi over 3. You've got to take those values for theta, toss it back into the polar equation for theta to see what the r's would be. And I'm going to let you finish that off. So there are two points where there's a horizontal tangent three points where there's a vertical tangent. And, you know, I think I want you to practice just one of these right now. There may only be a couple of homework problems doing this. But I'd like you to try number 26. So do number 26 in the section 12, three exercises. So you know the drill. Pause the video, do 26. And then uh, restart the video after you've done it, and I'll be at the board cranking through it. Okay, 26, you were given r equals 2 plus 2 sine theta. You're asked to find where there's horizontal tangents, where there are vertical tangents. And I went ahead and kind of preloaded the board. 
that for horizontal tangents, we know y equals r sine theta. Toss that in for r. Vertical, x equals r cosine theta. Toss 2 plus 2 sine theta in for the r. So, you know, here, before I go off to find dy d theta, I think I would distribute that sine theta. And now I get dy d theta as, well, that's a 2 cosine theta plus a 4 sine theta hmm, cosine theta using the chain rule. So that's not too bad. So now I want to know where this is equal to 0. So I set dy d theta equal to 0. And you know what? I can I can immediately divide both sides of the equation by 2. And well, look at this. I can factor out a cosine. And I can set each factor equal to 0. So where does cosine equal 0? Well, that happens at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Subtract 1 from both sides, divide both sides by 2. So where does sine equal negative 1 half? Well, that's at 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. So now remember, I can make no claims that these are the values of theta where we have a horizontal tangent. I can make no claims. I have to go off and do the dx d theta. Uh, because remember, any theta that appears in both, we don't know what's happening. So let me come over here. And, you know what, well, let's, uh, let's distribute the cosine. And then, when I see a 2 sine theta cosine theta, well, that's the double angle identity for sine 2 theta. You know, this will just allow me to not have to use the product rule in getting dx d theta. So dx d theta, okay, so uh, that, the derivative of 2 cosine theta is negative 2 sine theta. The derivative of sine 2 theta is 2 cosine 2 theta. We want to know where this is equal to 0. Okay, my, I have sine and a cosine, but a cosine of 2 theta. So it's nice in this uh, number 26, we got to review a double angle identity for sine. We get a review, a double angle identity for cosine. So remember, cosine 2 theta has three different double angle identities. The one I'm going to use is the one that just involves sine, and that one is, uh, let me underline that, 1 minus 2 sine squared theta, double angle identity. So plowing on through this, uh, if I distribute the two, And then if I, you know what, if I, if I, I'm going to do a couple of steps at once here. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 2. And then I'm going to rewrite the right-hand side so it's in descending order. So I'm doing those two steps at once. So if I divide this by negative 2, that gives me a 2 sine squared. Divide this by negative 2, gives me a sine. Divide that by negative 2, gives me a minus 1. Hopefully this factors. So a 2 sine theta here, sine theta here. I think it factors like that. Check it and make sure. 
Yep, that's the correct factorization. Set each factor equal to zero. So uh, add one, divide by two. Here, subtract one. So sine theta is equal to, to negative one at three pi over two. Sine theta is equal to one half at pi over six and five pi over six. All right, now we're close to answering the question. Notice, three pi over two is in the horizontal list and the vertical list. So we don't know what's happening at a theta value of three pi over two. We'd have to look at the graph of this to try to rectify it. So, let me try to put my answers, oops, let me try to put my answers into that area right there. We have horizontal tangents at theta equals pi over 2, 7 pi over 6, and 11 pi over 6. If you put each of those values of theta back in here to determine r, you will get you have horizontal tangents at the following points. When pi over 2 goes, comes in here for, r, for theta, you get 4. When 7 pi over 6 comes in, you get 1. And when 11 pi over 6 goes in, you also get 1. So these are the three points where we have a horizontal tangent. Vertical Well, remember pi, 3 pi over 2 is in both lists, so there are two uh, values of theta where there's a vertical tangent, pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. And you put those values of theta respectively in here to determine r, and you should get when pi over 6 goes in for theta, r is 3. And when 5 pi over 6 goes in for uh, theta, you also get 3. So, two points where there's a vertical tangent, three points where there's a horizontal tangent. So, a lot of trig stuff is, is involved here. Um, you know, identities, using identities. So, uh, well, let's head back to the slides and see what we're going to do next. All right, folks, hopefully that example and uh, number 26, you are able to see it's uh, not too bad finding horizontal and vertical tangents. Um, so the next example, let's consider um, the polar equation, r equals two minus two cosine theta. Now let's determine the slope of the tangent line at a theta value of pi over six. So let's head off to the chalkboard and do this. Hi right, folks, in this one we're just asked uh, for the, the, the polar equation, r equals two minus two cosine theta. Determine the slope of the tangent line at theta equals pi over 6. So we definitely need to get dy dx here. Um, so a little bit of prep work. We know x equals r cosine theta. We know y equals r sine theta. So we know x equals 2 minus 2 cosine theta cosine theta. y equals 2 minus 2 cosine theta sine theta, which I'll go ahead and distribute the cosine theta. Here I'll go ahead and distribute the sine theta. And you know what? 
two sine theta, cosine theta. That's uh, sine two theta using a double angle identity. So we need dy dx because it tells us slope of a tangent line. We know dy dx is dy d theta over dx d theta. So y is 2 sine theta minus sine 2 theta. So dy d theta is, well, that derivative is 2 cosine theta minus the derivative of sine 2 theta is 2 cosine 2 theta. So all over dx d theta. So here's, here's x. So dx d theta. See, that would be negative 2 sine theta minus, okay, now here I have to remember the chain rule, so that would be a 4 cosine theta, and then the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so that means that would become a plus. That's your derivative. That tells you slope of the tangent line. You need to evaluate it at pi over 6. So you get 2 times the cosine of pi over 6 minus 2 times the cosine. All right, well, two, pi over 6 goes in for theta. 2 times pi over 6, that's pi over 3. Negative 2 times the sine of pi over 6 plus 4 cosine pi over 6 times the sine of pi over 6. So let's see, cosine of pi over 6. Cosine of pi over 6 is square root 3 over 2. So you have 2 times square root 3 over 2 minus 2 cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Down denominator, uh, let's see, sine of pi over 6, that's 1 half. And then 4 times cosine of pi over 6, square root 3 over 2, sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So let's see, what does all that become? So in the numerator here, uh, well, we just have square root 3 minus 1. That's not too bad. In the denominator here, we'd have a negative 1 plus, when I multiply this together, I get square root 3. So square root 3 minus 1 over negative 1 plus square root 3, we, square root 3 minus 1 over, you can rewrite these to square root 3 minus 1. Slope of the tangent line at theta equals pi over 6 is 1. That's not too bad. Doing derivatives, slope of tangent line, and polars, not too bad. As long as you remember this, and as long as you remember how to differentiate things that, that we learned in the parametric world, not too bad. Let's head back to the slides because what we're about to do next it's going to take a little bit of development. It's the area question. All right, so the uh, slope of the graph of a polar equation, that's not too bad. We just relied on conversions. Uh, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and our knowledge of how to differentiate parametrics. Now the other question, the question of area. The question of area is just a little bit more involved, so we have to take a little bit of time uh, to, to develop what's happening here. First off, we do need to review something from trigonometry. Um, so if you, have a, if you consider a circle to be an angle that measures 2 pi radians, then the sector, think, think a piece of pie or a piece of pizza, the sector with central angle theta, it makes up a fraction of a complete circle, namely theta over 2 pi. 
So let's look at a quick picture here. What you see in the picture is a sector of a circle. You, know, you have theta there, um, and there's even, you know, I have something on there, you know, an S major, you know, that might remember that is, you know, arc length. Um, but that's a sector of a circle. That picture showing you a sector of the circle. Now we know the area of a complete circle uh, is pi r squared. So the area of that sector is nothing more than the product of the fraction theta over 2 pi and the total area. So quite simply, the area of that sector is just simply theta over 2 pi times pi r squared. And hopefully you would see the, uh, uh, you know, pi's cancel out. So that would simplify to a formula that you should have seen in trigonometry, that the area of a sector of a circle is nothing more than 1 half r squared theta, where r is the radius and theta is the central angle measured in radians. All right, we needed to, we needed to do a quick review of that because that's going to be important as we go on and trying to develop what in the world is happening when we find area and polar coordinates. Well, if we go way back to Calc 1, the first time we started to address this area question, uh, we were looking at areas and rectangular coordinates, and we used thin rectangular strips, and the fact that the area of a rectangle is base times height, um, and that, that made sense. Since in the rectangular world, remember the rectangular world is a left-right world, up-down world. So it made sense that we were looking at thin rectangular strips. It doesn't make sense to consider rectangular strips in the polar world because the polar world is an around and around, in towards the pole, away from the pole world. So in polar coordinates, the around and around and in towards the pole and away from the pole world, we need to use the fact from tri trigonometry that we just reviewed. We need to use the fact that the area of a sector of a circle of radius r and central angle theta in radians is given by, well, the area of a sector is 1 half r squared theta. And what I need to do right now is I need to make a quick trip to the chalkboard to get a general picture of what we are doing. So I'm heading off to the chalkboard. All right, folks, we just left off with, uh, uh, you know, we, we know how to find the area of a sector. Uh, so here's what we need to do when finding area and polar coordinates. First off, I just generically drew something. I'm saying that that's the curve, that's the graph of some polar equation, r equals f of theta. And let's say we wanted to find the area, determine the area of this piece right here that's between the radial lines alpha and beta. So I went ahead and sketched in an angle that measures alpha and an angle that measures beta. In the rectangular world, we did thin rectangular slices and used area of a rectangle's base times height. That's because in the rectangular world, it's a left, right, up and down world. In the polar world, we can't do that. In the polar world, it's an around and around and away from the pole in towards the pole. That's why we reviewed how to find the area of a sector as, you know, one half r squared theta, theta is in, in radians. It's because in the polar world, we're going to be making thin sectors because it's an around and around, away from the pole and in towards the pole. So let me put in one, it's not going to look too thin, of a sector because I want you to see what's happening. So let me just kind of say that's some angle theta. And... <coughs> Excuse me. To find the air, oh, let me let me uh, let me say that's a small change in theta. You know, I'm making this large so we can see it. So if if we consider 
the area of this, I'm just interested, I mean that's a sector, I'm just interested in, uh, you know what's the area of that little sector? And let me call the, let me call that area, let me call it an element of area. Um, let me just represent it as dA. Well, you know, it's, the, it's, it's a sector. It's, it, we have the formula for area of a sector. You know, the area here, dA, is one-half r squared d theta. You know what? Let me represent that with a d theta. That sounds a little better. So, Remember, in the rectangular world, we looked at thin rectangles, and the area was the base times the height. Base, delta x, times the height, f of x. Base, dx, times the height, f of x. That was the area of a single rectangle. And then you know what the game was? Um, I mean, you know what the game is. We're going to put a whole bunch of those in there. We know how to find the area of one. So we put a whole bunch in there, add them all up, we take the limit of a sum, sounds like a definite integral to me, so the, the area, we're going to add up all of those little increments of area, all those little DAs, remember I could put a, I could put a whole bunch of little thin sectors in there, which... I mean, I need to get some, I'm going to get some generic limits up here, because limit of a sum is a definite integral. Uh, one half r squared d theta, or so again, just kind of think. This is the area. This is telling us the area of a small sector. When we integrate from alpha to beta, we're taking the limit of the sum. We're adding up all of those small sectors. So the limit of a sum. This is how we find the area in a polar world. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to head back to the slides. I'm going to do a little bit of talking once I head back to the slides. And this is going to pop up in a theorem on how we find area and polar coordinates. So let's go back to the slides and see where this takes us. All right, folks, uh, you heard me say this more than once on the chalkboard, but I think it's worth mentioning one more time. The process of integration in general, the big idea in integration is you take a region, you slice up the region, so here in the polar world, that region went from the radial line alpha to the radial line beta. You slice up the region into many small subintervals, and in the polar world, that produced many tiny sectors. And then we added all those sectors up. I mean, it's the limit of a sum. So I'm going to put this into a theorem now. If f is continuous and non-negative, on the interval alpha to beta, then the area of the region bounded by the graph of r equals f of theta between those radial lines, theta equals alpha and theta equals beta, is nothing more than one half the integral alpha to beta f of theta squared. But since f of theta is r, you could think of it as being one half the integral alpha to beta r squared d theta. I mean, r is a function of theta. So I think we should uh, practice this. Uh, let's find the area of one petal of the rose curve. And let me show you what I would do first. The first thing I would do is I would use my graphing calculator uh, to see what the graph looks like. So uh, let me call up my graphing calculator. Here it is. Quickly, I'm going to make sure that I am in polar mode. Okay, I am. So I want to graph y equals 3 cosine 3 theta. 
and let me check my window. Uh, remember, I wanted my first look at the graph. I want to go the interval zero to two pi. So theta min zero, theta max two pi. Um, kind of looks like it already is there. My x min, I'm going to make negative six. My x max, I'm going to make six. Uh, y min, negative four. Y max, four. You know, that, that's using integers that's pretty close to a square window, um, if you wanted to make a note of that. So here, I'm going to look at the graph now. Yeah, it's a rose curve, three petals. We're asked to find the, the area of one petal, just one petal. It doesn't matter which petal. All the three petals are the same size. So it doesn't matter which pedal. So I'm going to head off to the chalkboard. I'm going to put this graph on the chalkboard, and then we're going to continue with the problem. All right, folks, here's our first example of finding area. It's to find the area of one pedal of the uh, uh, rose curve given by r equals 3 cosine 3 theta. I used the graphing calculator. I saw that as a graph. So we only need to find the area of one petal. It doesn't matter which petal. All the petals have the same size. Just any one of the three. So first thing I did was the graph. Second, I got to try to figure out my limits of integration. Now look at the graph. This graph happens to hit the pole. We know when you hit the pole, your r value is zero. r is distance from the pole. So when you hit the pole, when you're at the pole, r is zero. So if we put zero in for r, and we solve this equation, I keep in mind zero equals cosine three theta. You know what must what is it, cosine of what is zero? That's right, pi over two and three pi over two. So that means this three theta could equal a pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. And then you may remember from trig, the 3 tells you to go around the unit circle three times to find angles coterminal with these two. So coterminal to pi over 2, so I just add 2 pi to that. You know, I get a 5 pi over 2, add 2 pi to this, 7 pi over 2, add 2 pi to that, 9 pi over 2, 2 pi to that, Ooh, barely fit it on, 11 pi over 2. So that's what 3 theta would equal. So theta, theta is found by just dividing each of those by 3. So we get pi over 6, pi over 2, 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 3 pi over 2, and 11 pi over 6. All right, so... Here's what I would do, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I, I have an idea of what my limits of integration will be. I'm just trying to find the area of one pedal. So I would, and I'm going to ask you to, uh, re-graph, so fire up your calculator, re-graph this, and why don't you make pi over 6 theta min, and make pi over 2 theta max and see if that does produce one of the petals. So go ahead, I'll, I'll wait for you. So why don't you pause the video, go ahead and, and re-graph it. If you made this theta min, you made that theta max, it should have traced out just that petal. So we would have limits of integration to do the problem, but I want to show you something else. I'm looking at this pedal. I'm thinking this pedal. Well, if I regraph this function with a theta min of zero, and a theta max of pi over 6, because I know pi over 6, I'm back at the pole. I think this will trace out 
the top half of this petal. If it traces out the top half of that petal, I bet that means if I looked at the theta min value of negative pi over 6, so I graphed it on theta min negative pi over 6 to pi over 6, I bet it traces out the entire petal. But the fact that it does the top half, I'm going to start off right away, I'm going to say, let's use symmetry. You know, if I integrate from 0 to pi over 6, it's fine in that area. Multiply that by 2, and that gives me the entire petal. So I'm going to say the area, I'm starting off by using symmetry, 2 times 1 half. The integral, 0 to pi over 6, r squared, that's 3 cosine 3 theta, quantity squared, d theta. And, wow, this isn't too bad. You get 0 to pi over 6, uh, 9, cosine squared 3 theta, d theta. Rip the 9 out front. And now I'm left with a cosine squared 3 theta. Cosine squared 3 theta. So let me write in here. Hmm. Hmm. Remember this power reducing identity? Yeah, that's pretty important to do this problem. Cosine squared 3 theta. So I'm putting 3 theta in place of the x. So when 3 theta comes in place of the x, I get uh, 1 half, 1 plus cosine 6 theta, d theta. And then, yeah, I can rip the 1 half out front. And I'm going to skip a step of just writing that down again. I'm going to get the integral. Antiderivative of 1 is theta. Antiderivative of cosine 6 theta. That's 1 6 sine 6 theta. Evaluate that from 0 to pi over 6. So we have 9 halves times a pi over 6 plus, all right, sine 6, 6 theta. So 6 times pi over 6. Well, 6 times pi over 6 is pi. The sine of pi, sine of pi is 0. That's kind of nice. Uh, 1 6 times 0 is 0. Minus 9 halves. Well, that's 0, and that's 0. Wow, that ended up being uh, way too nice. So we get, uh, what, 9 pi over 12, which reduces down to 3 pi over 4. Do you have to use symmetry? No. Do you have to find the area of the pedal that I did? No. You can find the area of any pedal that you want. So you could have started this off by using a, a lower limit of integration of pi over 6, an upper limit of integration of pi over 2, which would have found the area of this pedal. So it would be 1 half integral pi over 6 to pi over 2. 3 cosine 3 theta squared, you're going to get the same answer. I just thought I would show you maybe it, it's a little more efficient, you know, to kind of say, hey, I could use symmetry and I can look at that one particular pedal. So what if, what if you were asked to find the area of all three petals. It would be an incredibly big mistake to say, oh well, I'll just uh, do one half times the integral 0 to 2 pi of 3 cosine 3 theta squared d theta. It would be wrong to just make your limits of integration 0 to 2 pi. And here's why. 0 to 2 pi. If you graph this on the interval 0 to 2 pi, 
technically speaking, that curve is traced out more than once. Don't believe me? Graph it on the interval 0 to pi. Theta min 0, theta max pi. And you will see that graph. So that tells me if I integrate from 0 to 2 pi, I'm, I'm going to have a wrong answer. I could integrate from 0 to pi and get the correct answer. Or I could just do what hopefully you're all saying to yourself right now, the most obvious thing. If I know the area of one petal, why not just take this answer and multiply it by 3? To get the area of all three petals is 9 pi over 4. That would be the slick way to do it. So if you were asked this question, I think the slick way to do it is find the area of one petal, which we did here, and then just multiply by three. All right, let's head on back to the slides, see uh, what, what's next. I'm sure it's going to be another example, but let's see what it is. All right, there was a lot going on in that last example. Um, you know, it, it had some good stuff in it. Uh, we found area. Uh, as we saw in that last example, the power reducing identities are going to be uh, uh, playing, a, playing a role here in finding area. So one more time, those are the power reducing identities. And here's the paradigm that I use to find area and polar coordinates. So, you know, we kind of saw it in the last example. The first thing I do is I graph the polar equation, see what the graph looks like. And then I determine the region I'm finding the area for, and I try to determine the limits of integration. You know, then in that last example, I asked you to do this, to check the limits of integration by re-graphing the polar equation to ensure um, it really is producing the region we're interested in. And when you re-graph, you know, you check your limits of integration, um, you know, part one here, that's telling you what your theta min should be, and it's telling you what your theta max should be. So that's what I mean when I say re-graph. And then once you're, um, once you're squared away, once you know you have the correct limits of integration, everything's good, you know, then it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, we just do it. We integrate away. So let's look at another example. Let's consider r equals 2 minus 4 sine theta. We're going to find the area inside the inner loop. Then in part b, how would we find the area inside the outer loop? And then part c, what's the area of the region that's between the inner loop and the outer loop? So, well, you know what? The first thing I would do is graph. So let me... Uh, let me call up my calculator again so I can, uh, you know, graph this beastie so I, you'll see what I'm going to put on the board. So we're graphing 2 minus 4 sine theta. And I think this viewing window, that, that should be good. So here comes the graph. Oh, look, the graph kind of went off my screen a little bit. So my, I'm going to go back to my window. Um, let's see, a y min of negative 4. That wasn't good enough. So maybe I need to go, uh, boy, let's see. Um, I'll just go negative 6. Let's see if that's good enough. Ooh, it just barely made it on. So that's what the graph looks like. That's what I'm going to put on the board. I can see in part A, I'm just going to find, I just want to find the area of this region that's inside the inner loop. Part B, I want to find the area that's inside the outer loop. So it's this right here. This is inside the outer loop. I mean, all of this is inside the outer loop. Then in part C, find the area of the region that's between the inner loop and the outer loop. So part C is just going to be this area. Hopefully you're able to see what I'm trying to, to highlight here. So, and just kind of looking ahead, it looks like the answer to part C is going to be nothing more than the area that's inside the outer loop. 
that's part B, minus the area that's inside the inner loop, that's part A. But let's head off to the chalkboard and uh, finish this off. All right, folks, uh, we were given R equals 2 minus 4 sine theta. Part A, what's the area inside the inner loop? Part B, what's the area inside the outer loop? Part C, what's the area between the loops? So I tried, I mean, I did this um, on the graphing calculator. I tried to show you that for part A, we're asked to get the area that's inside the inner loop. So that is... that area. Well notice the inner loop begins at an R value that starts at, it's at the pull, trace out the inner loop, and then we're back at the pull. So we should find the values of theta where R puts you at the pull, where R is zero. So we set this equal to zero. You get one half is sine theta. So theta is pi over six and five pi over six. So what you should do, I laid this out in the paradigm, is you should regraph this on a theta min of pi over six, a theta max of five pi over six, just to verify that the inner loop is traced out. So when you regraph it, you will see that's actually true. So if you need to pause the video to regraph it to make sure that uh, I'm not lying to you, please pause the video and then restart it when you're ready to go because I'm moving on. I know that's true. So for part A, that area is one half the integral pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6 r squared d theta all right if you wanted to make use of uh, symmetry I believe halfway between pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 would be uh, uh, pi over 2. So you could rewrite this as 2 times 1 half times the integral pi over 6 to pi over 2 r squared d theta. You could do that. Uh, I'm just going to plow ahead with what we have. So let's see. Uh, 1 half the integral pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6. Gosh, when I foil this out, I get a 4 minus 16 sine theta plus 16 sine squared theta d theta. Uh, power reducing identity. Four minus 16 sine theta. So I'm using the power reducing identity here. So that would be one half quantity 1 minus cosine 2 theta. So that gives me, uh, well, the 16 times 1 half. That's kind of nice. 18 times 1 minus cosine 2 theta, d theta. I need some more room. So pulling the problem up here, I'm uh, going to do two steps at once. Notice I would distribute the 8 here to get an 8 minus 8 cosine 2 theta. So when I pull it up here, I'm going to combine any like terms we have. And it looks like I'd have a 4 plus 8, which is 12. And then a minus 16 sine theta. And then minus 8 cosine 2 theta. Let's get let's let's get an antiderivative. So that's uh, 12 theta antiderivative here. 
is what 16 cosine theta plus 16 cosine theta. Uh, antiderivative here, I think it's a minus 4 sine 2 theta. Evaluate this mess from pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6. Okay, folks, I'm going to let you put, put it in and do the uh, 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 fundamental theorem of calculus. If you do it correctly, boy, you're going to end up with a 4 pi minus 6 square root 3. That's the answer for A. So I need to erase all of this work I just did. And I'm going to put that outside here. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll put it in uh, red. But we have the answer for A is 4 pi minus 6 square root 3. So let me erase this so I can uh, try to do part B at least set up part B. So part B, part B is uh, the area that's inside, inside the outer loop. Now I, I tried to show you this on the, uh, uh, on the calculator, that inside the outer loop, it is, All of that area. So we need to see what traces out just the outer loop. All right, now we know the inner loop was traced from pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6. So I'm thinking the outer loop starts off at 5 pi over 6. So it starts off at 5 pi over 6. And notice if I just go to 2 pi, 2 pi would stop me right here. I would be missing this piece of the outer loop. So I need to go beyond 2 pi to come right back to the pole. And when I do that, I think that tells me... 13 pi over 6. So what you should do, if you don't believe it, you should re-graph this beastie with a theta min of 5 pi over 6 and a theta max of 13 pi over 6 to see that it just traces out the outer loop. So then we know for part B, the area is 1 half the integral 5 pi over 6 to 13 pi over 6. R squared d theta. And we've already done the antiderivative for this in part A. We've already, you can go through it. I mean, you can see what we did. Um, I'm going to say that, uh, you know, you can see what the exact answer is. Decimally, this is pretty close to 35.525. But you could come up with the exact value for that if you want. Part C, well, what's the area that's between? So that would be... You know, that region right there. Well, as I said on the slide, when I had the graph on my graphing calculator, I think for part C, the area between the loops is nothing more than the area that's inside the outer loop minus the area that's inside the inner loop. So the area inside the outer loop, that's our answer to part B, 
minus the area inside the inner loop. That's our answer to part A. And if you, you can see what you get for an exact value. Decimally, it's pretty close to 31.17. So I do have one I want you to do. Um, let me look here real quick. On the supplement 12.3, uh, I got some supplemental exercises there. I'd like you to pause the video and I'd like you to do number six. So go ahead and pause the video, do number six. When you're done with number six, restart the video. I'll be here cranking through it to make sure you have the correct answer. All right, number six was determine the area of the inner loop of r equals one plus cos one plus two cosine theta. So that's the graph. This is what we're trying to find the uh, the area for. Notice the inner loop starts and ends when it hits the pole. When you hit the pole, r equals zero. So you take r equals 1 plus 2 cosine theta, set it equal to 0, solve for theta, so negative 1 half equals cosine theta, that occurs at theta equals, uh, what, 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. So one more time, you should re-graph with the theta min at 2 pi over 3 and a theta max of 4 pi over 3 to verify it does produce the inner loop. So your area is 1 half the integral 2 pi over 3 to 4 pi over 3 r squared d theta and you know what, folks? I would make use of uh, I would make use of symmetry here, uh, and I'm going to integrate from two pi over three to pi. So I'm going to use symmetry just to find area of half of the inner loop, and then multiply it by two. See if I foil this out, I get uh, a one plus a four cosine theta plus a four cosine squared theta. And, uh, oh yeah, double angle identity. So remember, cosine squared theta is one half one plus cosine two theta. So since it's preceded by four, it's four times one half. So that's 2, 1 plus cosine 2 theta. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine a couple of steps at once. I distribute the 2. So 2 times 1 is 2. Plus 1 is 3. Plus a 4 cosine theta. And then that gives me a plus 2 cosine 2 theta. So I think we're finally ready to get an antiderivative. See the antiderivative of 3 is 3 theta. Antiderivative of 4 cosine theta. That's a 4 sine theta. An antiderivative of 2 cosine 2 theta. Oh, that's not bad. That's just sine 2 theta. Evaluate that from pi over 3 to pi. So let's see, the pi comes in for theta, so we'll have a 3 pi. Sine of pi is 0. Sine of 2 pi is 0. So we just have a 3 pi minus, okay, now pi over 3 comes in for theta, so 3 times pi over 3, oh, that's pi. So let's see, sine, sine of... Uh, 
pi over 3, sine of pi over 3, that's square root 3 over 2. So we have 4 times square root 3 over 2 plus uh, 2 times pi over 3 is 2 pi over 3. Sine of 2 pi over 3 is also square root 3 over 2. So we get, let's see, 3 pi minus pi. I lost the 2 somewhere, folks. Oh, right here. I'm sorry. I lost the 2. I had a typo at the board again. Uh, so let me, let me crank through the fundamental theorem of calculus again. It doesn't change when pi goes in. We get a 3 pi. Okay, it does change. That was a 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3 comes in here for theta. 3 times 2 pi over 3. That's 2 pi. Plus, okay, sine of 2 pi over 3. Well, that's square root 3 over 2. 2 pi over 3 comes in here for theta. 2 times 2 pi over 3. Well, that's 4 pi over 3. The sine of 4 pi over 3. That's negative square root 3 over 2. So now let's clean it up. 3 pi minus 2 pi leaves us with pi. Here you would have 4 square root 3 over 2 minus square root 3 over 2. So that right there combined gives us a 3 square root 3 over 2 minus, so it's minus that, and I would not get a common denominator to get one fraction. That's good as it is. So hopefully you were able to get this. Hopefully you didn't make a, a careless typo like I did. So hopefully you are able to get this. Um, let's head back to the slides and see what the next example is. All right, so that example, and then I asked you to do number six from the 12.3 supplement. Hopefully, uh, we're getting a little bit more dialed in with this. Have another example. Let's find the area of the region that's inside 3 sine theta and outside r equals 1 plus sine theta. So, you know, before I head off to the chalkboard, I am going to look at the graph. So let me uh, come here, let's see, the graph is, let's see, that's the graph of, uh, whoop, let me clear that, 3 sine theta, and 1 plus sine theta. Check the window real quick, you know what, I, I, I'm going to make my y min negative 4. Theta min is 0, theta max is 2 pi. So here comes the graph. I'm going to put this on the board. So when I go to the board and I put this on the board, um, notice what I'm, I'm trying to do. It's the area of the region that's inside 3 sine theta. That's the blue curve. And outside, r equals 1 plus sine theta. That's the red curve. So we're inside the circle, outside the cardioid. I think it's going to be, well, it's this region right here. Kind of looks like a crescent moon. So I'm going to head off to the board and I'm going to put this on the board. And then finish the problem. All right, folks, in this example, we're asked to find the area that's inside r equals 3 sine theta and outside r equals 1 plus sine theta. So that was the graph that, that I did on my calculator. And it looks to me like, see, we're inside the circle given by r equals 3 sine theta, but outside the uh, cardioid given by r equals 1 plus sine theta. We're trying to find the area of that region right there. So first things first, we need to determine points of intersection. 
points of intersection. We need to determine where does 1 plus sine theta equal 3 sine theta. Subtract sine theta from both sides, divide both sides by 2, and we get, see, where does sine theta equal 1 half? Sine theta equals 1 half at pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. So that, that would be these radial lines, pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. So just kind of looking ahead, it looks to me like the radial line that would be halfway between pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 is pi over 2. And if we integrate from pi over 6 to pi over 2, it'd be finding that region. And we should be able to multiply by 2. We should be able to use uh, symmetry. So I'm going to set this up. Area is by immediately using symmetry. 1 half times 2, the integral pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6. Okay, now what is it that I'm integrating? Well, you remember in the rectangular world when we were talking about area maybe between two curves, you know, we integrated the top curve minus the bottom curve, and that worked in the rectangular world because the rectangular world was a left-right, up and down world. The polar world is an around and around, away from the pole and towards the pole. So to find this area, I need to subtract what's furthest away minus what's in closest. Well, what's furthest away is the curve given by 3 sine theta. minus what's in closest. Well, what's in closest is this, which is given by, that's the piece of the cardioid given by 1 plus sine theta. And, you know, I, I think you should be able to finish this problem from here. Um, I mean, you know, it's a lot of the difficulties getting it set up. You should be able to take this and square it, minus. You should be able to FOIL that out. Make sure you put the result of the FOIL inside parentheses. Distribute the negative. You should be able to combine like terms. You should be able to uh, use a power reducing identity. Um, so you should be able to finish it from here. So I'm going to let you finish it from here, and you end up getting the area Believe it or not, the area is going to be pi. And there is one more. There's one more. Besides finishing this, there's one more I'd like you to do. I have it written down back here. And what I'd like you to do in your book, so the section 12.3 exercises, number 51. It's probably the trickiest types of problems we could see right now. So um, make sure you get pi here. Pause the video. Make sure you get pi. And do number 51. And after you do 51, restart the video. Um, and, you know, I'll be here at the board cranking through it. Yeah, I might look at a slide real quick because it's so tricky. I may want to look at the graph um, and then show you what I think is tricky about it and then I'll come back to the board. All right, folks, I know I asked you to do number uh, 51. Um, I said I would come look at a quick graph. It's the area that's inside 4 sine 2 theta and inside r equals 2. So let me look at a quick graph of that. So r equals 4 sine 2 theta. 4 sine 2 theta and r equals 2 and I think my current viewing window that should be good so okay the graph of r equals 4 sine 2 theta it's the rose curve that's in blue r equals 2 is the circle um, that's in red 
So first off, we're talking about the area that's inside the rose curve and inside R equals two. So I think it's this region plus this region plus this region plus this region. All right, so here's the first thing. I am just gonna find the area of one of those four regions and then multiply that by four to answer the question. I mean, there's a lot of neat symmetry here. But I'm a little concerned about what's really happening. Um, so I, I'm just gonna kind of focus on what's going on here in quadrant one. And because I really need to see what's happening, I'm gonna re-graph. And I, because I just wanna see a little more closely quadrant one, I'm gonna make my X min zero and my Y min zero. Now I'm gonna look at the graph. Yeah, I, I see a little bit of a concern. This is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up putting this on the board, um, but here's what I'm kind of looking at. Radial lines. It looks like if I have a radial line that kind of comes right like this, and then a radial line that kind of comes just like that, I think there's a little sliver here of area and there's a little sliver of area here and then between those two radial lines well we have we have the curve that would be bounded by the circle we'd have all that area so I'm glad I looked at it a little more closely because I think to find the area that's uh, inside the rose curve and inside R equals two, just here in quadrant one, I think I'm gonna have to start off by setting up three, integ three integrals and adding them together. Um, so here's what I need to do. I need to head off to the chalkboard. I'm gonna put this picture up on the chalkboard. We have a lot of work to do, but we're gonna take our time doing it. Um, so let's go back to the chalkboard. All right, number 51. Find the area that's inside r equals 4 sine 2 theta and inside r equals 2. So we looked at the graph and we saw the graph. We saw a rose curve with four petals and then a circle. And then I said something, well I did mention this. It would be uh, the area of these regions here. And I said hey, if we could just find the area of one of those regions and then multiply by four, we'll answer the question. But I said something looked a little funny to me and I wanted to uh, graph it on a different viewing window to just kind of look at what was happening there in quadrant one. And here's, here's what I saw. And hopefully I can get a, a decent looking picture here. Looking at these points of intersection and Make sure I'll make it bigger so I hit. Those are radial lines. In fact, I can find the points of intersection by setting uh, my two polar curves equal to each other. And, uh, oh, we get one half, I'm sorry. It's sine two theta. So two theta must be a pi over six. Five pi over six. And then I could go ahead and finish it off. 13 pi over 6, 17 pi over 6. Divide everything by 2. And it's just the first two that I care about here because the first two match up with the two angles in quadrant 1. So this, this is theta is pi over 12. And this one here is theta equals 5 pi over 12. So here's what I'm seeing. When I go from a theta value of 0 to pi over 12, it's just tracing this out. That's it. That's bounded by the 4 sine 2 theta. So I'm looking at just that little sliver of area. from pi over 12 to 5 pi over 12. So here's pi over 12 to 5 pi over 12. 
Well, this wedge, if you will, that's bounded by the circle, r equals 2. And then from 5 pi over 12 to pi over 2, it's bounded by this piece of the rose. Folks, I have to set up three integrals to find that area, this entire area. I need to set up three integrals where my first integral is from 0 to pi over 12. And it's only bounded by the rose curve. So it's only bounded by 4 sine 2 theta squared. <coughs> Plus, when I go from pi over 12 to 5 pi over 12, Well, it's just r, I mean, r is 2. That's it. It's just bounded by r equals 2. That's going to be friendly. Plus, when I go from 5 pi over 12 to pi over 2, well, that is bounded by 4 sine 2 theta. Alright, so I have, I have three integrals that I have to evaluate, but you know I'm going to make use of symmetry. I mean, this sliver here is the exact same as that sliver there. So I would just say these two integrals are going to give the same thing. So why don't I just evaluate one of them? and multiply it by 2. So when I take this 1 and multiply it by 2, I'm just integrating from 0 to pi over 12, 4 sine 2 theta squared d theta, plus 1 half the integral pi over 12 to 5 pi over 12. Well, 2 squared is 4. I might as well write that down. All right, so I'm going to have you end up finishing this. Square this, that gives you a 16 sine squared 2 theta. Rip the 16 out front, so you're left with the sine squared 2 theta. Use the power reducing identity on sine squared 2 theta. Then you'll evaluate, uh, I mean, this is easy. I mean, I mean I'm not even going to talk about that. So you integrate, and you end up, for that one region that's out in quadrant 1, you're going to get... 4 pi over 3 minus square root 3. So the answer, because remember there were four regions, quadrant 1, 2, 3, and 4, is just four times what's happening in quadrant 1. So either one of those would be fine. So that's the trickiest one I think we can do, and that's because you have to look carefully at the graph. Take your time. You know, I broke it down that I'd have to set up three integrals, uh, and I think the hard part is probably getting them set up. So that's it for section 12.3. At this time, you should be able to do all the exercises in the 12.3 uh, homework. So go do the exercises, and thanks for watching.